What to make of Jarris Walker's recent improvements for the Pacers? Where has he grown the most? Can he keep playing like this for the Pacers? Plus, the Pacers bench keeps winning against starters. Can they keep it up past California? Big game tonight. We'll explain why with Derek Kramer. All on today's Locked On Pacers podcast. You are Locked On Pacers, your daily Indiana Pacers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. y'all happy wednesday and welcome into another edition of the locked on pacers podcast where we of course talk about the indiana pacers as always my name is tony east i cover the team for forbes and si and today we're diving in to some topics du jour on the pacers starting with jaris walker the story of their monday game recently playing better in his rotational spots can this be a thing where has he developed for the pacers Derek kramer from my pacers blog and i chatted up about Jarris Walker with some takes about the rotation and Jarris going forward. Plus the bench and Pascal, an amazing unit that keeps winning fourth quarters. Is that a sustainable thing? Some crazy numbers there and a big game tonight against the Bulls. We explain why at the end with many other tidbits in between Derek, I Pacers blog and I dive right into it. Let's just jump right in. He's back. He needs a little introduction. I should have had him on talking about Miles Turner, Blake in the breaking the block record because he has tracked every block for Miles Turner during his career. It's Derek Kramer from iPacers blog. And Derek, we're not talking about Miles Turner today. I apologize. Are you also incessantly watching the Heat Warriors score right now? I was. I was watching the the whole first half, and then I uh, was getting ready for this. So I haven't watched it, and now the Warriors are going on a run, so I should just not pay attention to it anymore, apparently, and let it go. It might finish while we're recording, so you can hear us see what the Pacers are are looking at scoreboard watching tonight. I would th- I don't know if they actually react, but I would love to like somehow have a camera view of Kevin Pritchard seeing the Jimmy Butler out illness notification hit his phone <laughs> in the middle of the day before the game. Uh, we're gonna start Derek talking Pacers with Jarris Walker, the story of Monday's game by far, and it's crazy how an eight point game can look so impressive compared to where he has been all season because the passing was great the defense was great and he was so so impactful that rick said you know what you're playing the whole second quarter you're starting the second half you're going to be out there and i talked about it some yesterday but i'm curious to you because this obviously that game was to me at least his most impressive game but even when he was in the rotation for that needed stretch earlier this month right was very good in the overtime loss to Chicago, was good against Minnesota when they needed him for a good chunk of minutes. Like you could see he was bad in Orlando, but you could see in most of his appearances, like, yes, there are signs of progress for Jarris Walker, even outside of his best games. Where have you seen him improve the most? And what does, does that mean anything this season? Or is it still just if there's injuries, he's going to be useful. And if there's not, he's not going to play. Improvements, uh, interesting way because like his passing's always popped, but I don't, I've never like seven assists with like how little he really touches the ball on offense and the way that he got those assists, like they weren't just like swinging it to the next guy in a like a rotation of the ball, just yep. kind of moving. Like he's finding people in the rhythm, like the broken play where I think Toppin lost the ball in the paint and he just kind of, the ball just comes to him and he just instantly knows that Pascal's open right under the basket. And then like the, he's about to take a shot and finds Jalen Smith, like the, the passing prowess that he has is just awesome to watch. Um, But I don't know if that's like where you'd say his most improvement, like you expected him to be defense first but that's kind of been where you've seen the steady growth throughout the year. It seems like, like even in summer league, like General Parker was talking about how they just need him to gamble less to kind of stay solid, like an old Nate McMillan phrase. And like, it seems like that's where he's gotten better as the years goes on, like put him out there against Paul George at the beginning of the year. I don't think that goes as well as it did last night. I don't want to say that, Early in the season, the ball would stick. Like, it would get to Jarris, and he wouldn't know what to do. But what what makes his seven assists against the Clippers to pop to me is he'd catch and move it, right? Flip it to someone else. He he had the read ready, 
when the ball came his way. If that man needed to dribble or shoot too, he did the right thing. I mean, he made all his shots, so it's easy to say that. But to make the decision quickly, and I actually talked to him before they played the Pistons at his locker in Detroit, and he said like the thing that has kind of ignited to him the better play is that the game is slowing down, right? The rookie phrase that everybody uses where you get to the league and everyone's huge and everyone's fast and you're not the best player anymore. And so you have to like catch up to the speed of the game. And sometimes that's recognizing a pattern quicker. Sometimes that's knowing where space is going to be. Sometimes it's just that you've had the reps and you've watched the film so much on all these guys that you now understand where the advantages are. All that stuff's coming quicker to him, right? And so when you're playing a Clippers team that is old and creaky, <laughs> for lack of a better term, you know, the fact that he made those quick pop, get it out, do the right thing decisions really stood out to me. And, uh, you know, I talked to you a lot pre-draft about why I liked him the most of all the natural fits. And to me, the passing was the thing that I liked the most on offense because I thought even if the shot never comes, this can be a useful player. And that is is now showing up even with the shot being kind of a thing. I don't know if I buy it yet. Not because I don't think he can sustain it. It's just been such a small sample that I have no actual takeaways from him making the threes he's made so far. But to, but to just have the game slow down for him already, right? He's not even at 40 NBA games yet. Like that is... I think that's good. He's not even at 30 NBA games yet. Like that's huge for the Pacers. I think that speaks volumes about what he could be if the shot keeps falling and if he's able to kind of explore some space because like with some rookies, I'm rambling here, but with some rookies, like teams are like, uh oh, when they put the ball on the floor, right? It's like scary. You know, you don't know if it's going to be a turnover or something bad's going to happen or they're going to take a bad shot. I very rarely, he takes, Jarris takes some off the dribble threes and I'm like, ah, I don't know about that. But I very rarely think he does something that I'm like, why did he do that? You know, what was the thinking that went into that? And I think that combined with quick decision making has been where I've seen him kind of evolve the most from September Jarris Walker to March Jarris Walker. Yeah, I think even the like talking about the off the dribble threes, like the ones that he's taken, it seems like they've <laughs> they've gone in. So <laughs> it's hard to it's hard to say he's taking bad shots when he's making even the tough ones. He made like I can't remember which which of his many random flash in the pan feels like since he's not consistently in the rotation where he's like hits multiple back to back step back three pointers and all that. Um, that's probably like you talk about improvement like that's like he's what 38% like, like you said, maybe it's not real yet, but like that's better than you could have expected his rookie year for his shooting to go so far. Um, You'd rather be skeptical of a guy who has made them than skeptical of a guy who has not <laughs> Right. <laughs> also. Exactly. Um, <laughs> I'm getting uh, notifications. Um, one thing the, that I like, I just looked at cause I was curious cause it didn't feel like Walker was like touching the ball that much yesterday. So I was like, what was his like actual usage rate for the game against the Clippers? So a guy with eight points, seven assists. Uh, Can I guess? One, Is it like one seven per, seven percent? Even less. Oh Four point seven percent usage rate. <laughs> and he had eight points and seven assists. So like, it's kind of crazy. Like most of the time, he was just standing in the corner, and then like, and then he would make a play if the ball came to him. Like even the the three made where Tyrese just read the defense was just sagging so far off of him on the out of bounds play, like he took advantage of it. He caught the ball, hit the shot. Like obviously you're not going to expect him to. He's not going to make every one of his shots every night or anything like that. But just like it, he's it's been so exciting to see. And I think the the most exciting part about his rookie season so far is that he's doing a lot of this at the three. And yes. not he's not only been playing the four or the like I expected Jared if like Jared was going to have positional versatility it was going to be as like a four five not as a three four as a wing like he looks like a wing and not like a big and I think that's probably the biggest development of his rookie season. Yeah, I agree with that last part a lot and like the fact we'll talk about this in a second but a lineup we'll get to a lot today in in a future discussion has. Siakam Walker together. And I think that's been a fascinating sort of quasi development. This might feel too Pacers colored glasses. -y, so feel free to make, tell me if this sounds stupid, but having like having that small of a usage, but the team still keeping you out there says a lot about what you did with those limited touches. And like you actually did something important with them and you weren't killing the team being out there being basically a zero without the ball. And it says a lot about his defensive value in that game that they wanted him to play. Like I talked about this yesterday, but 
him and McConnell got caught in that two-man game with Kawhi and Russ, and he shut it down, and they forced a Westbrook three that he airballed and went out of bounds. Like, that's huge for him. That's not something he, he would have – the first time Kawhi shot faked when Russ returned him the ball – Early in the season, he's jumping, right? He's in the air, right? Like that, that's progress. It's all sorts of little stuff like that throughout the game. So, yeah, you, I mean, at some point, his usage has to be bigger <laughs> than, than that. But that that is progress for him. And, yeah, I agree that, especially if he can be a wing, like, I don't know what his dream, the, the ideal Jarris Walker position is because maybe it is three, maybe it's four, maybe it's five. Who knows? Who really cares? It's his first season. But if it can be on the wing and he can guard those guys because he is shifty and quick enough, that's huge. That's a development that I and very few people talked about, including myself, before the season. Yes. I have nothing else to add. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so with the, the other part I asked you about that we didn't really touch on is, do you think, like, if they're fully healthy, do you think he's playing now? Do you think he's still out? To me, it, it's an interesting because – McDermott wasn't good against the Lakers, but in general, or the Clippers, excuse me, he's been like fine on the road trip and gives them something they need with the shooting. But has he been good enough that you'd rather play him over Jarris? That's the discussion, right? And that's if they go 10 deep now, because the starting five seems pretty set. And then Shepard, McConnell, Top, and Smith seem pretty set. So if they go to a 10th guy, should it be Jarris now, right? Or do they have a short leash with him? How would you handle that now? I would play Jarris. I don't think he will play. <laughs> it's my, <laughs> I agree. My take, at least currently. I don't, I think when they get to the playoffs, if they get to the playoffs, all of that, um, that like Doug and Jarris probably both out of the rotation. I don't think they'll try to go 10 deep, is my guess. Um, I would like Jarris to play and get some, some minutes in some of these like hugely, impactful games over the rest of the season and in the playoffs. I think that would be awesome for his development and just like he makes so much happen. He's very versatile. Like you see it when he gets those minutes, like he's, he's a valuable player. I just, I don't know if, I don't know if Rick's there yet and we'll see. Yeah. I, yeah, it's tough. To, like if McDermott had a terrible road trip, like completely awful, I think, you know, Jarris would have been as effective as him, then it's easy. And I, I'm not saying that Doug was better than Jarris, but he had enough effective games doing the thing that they've been bad at since the break. They're like, okay, like maybe they'll keep trying it. But th this is silly. Like, I don't want to over make this point, but they did better in some of these games against terrible teams. And they had a four game buffer over the heat right now. They could be playing Jarris down the stretch of the season and then just not playing in the playoffs. That's not here or there. Hey guys, short little break here so we can talk about the lovely folks over at eBay Motors. Passion and drive and patience what brings home the winning trophy is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance from superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered with over 122 million parts. For your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay's guaranteed fit, your part is guaranteed. That's nice to fit your ride every time or you'll get your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash, with all the parts you need. At the prices you want, it is easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win. So keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay guaranteed fit. Only available to U.S. customers. Derek, I want to talk about something that keeps happening and I don't get it. <laughs> every game. This seems to happen. The fourth quarter, this isn't happening every game, but very frequently of late, the Pacers have entered the fourth quarter with a lead. This happened against the Clippers. This happened against the Warriors. This happened against the Mavs twice, I believe. I think this happened against the Thunder as well. They enter the fourth quarter with a lead somewhere between like 6 and 14, right? So the game is not over, but they're winning. And this is their rotation. It has been all season where... They start the second and fourth quarters with a largely bench group, if not all bench group, not all five. And we've seen recently Luca and Kyrie are out there to start the fourth quarter. Steph, Clay, and Draymond are out there to start the fourth quarter. Shea's out there to start the fourth quarter. Last night, Kawhi, PG, and uh, Russ. I don't think Harden was, but Russ was. All of them were out there to start the fourth quarter. And every time I go, okay, this is a big stretch, right? Can the bench hold the lead? until one of Siakam or Halliburton returns. And every time, every time they do it, how? I know they're like a very good bench group, perhaps the best in the NBA as like a full group together. 
right? But it just it's it's very shocking to me that they maybe I'm selling them short, but like I don't think of them as better than the team starters, even if I think they're a bad good bench group. So part of it is to me, I'll get to this in a second. The Siakam plush bench groups in the fourth quarter have been awesome, but even in the minutes without them, they're succeeding. I think that's been a very interesting trend of late, and I don't I don't get it. Not to I feel like I'm being mean to them by saying I don't get it, but like it's been fascinating to me. Yeah, I think the biggest thing is the the Pascal plus bench. Yes. I think that's completely changed. Like they don't have to go for that when we get there, but yes. Just like just having those the two stars that can really lead an offense and then being able to uh split their minutes and like have them carry lineups has just been awesome to watch. Um and then I think it's just like I, you can't give enough praise to TJ McConnell <laughs> who started the year yeah. like looking like he, he's going to be out of the rotation and like now should probably at least be getting some buzz, at least a little buzz for some six man of the year candidacy. Like, I don't think he should win it, but he was better than the guy I would vote for, for six man of the year last night. <laughs> yeah. So, so there, you there you go. There you go. <laughs> yeah. It's like, it's just like, it's, it's incredible how like even the lineups where I feel like, like, is there enough shooting for this bench group to like function? And like TJ McConnell just finds this little baseline twos on repeat anytime they need a bucket. Like, it's just, it's fascinating to watch. Uh, like he's, he's 32 now and he's still, still just outruns everybody on the court. Like I just, I don't know if it's just like the starters that are on the court, like they're a little more worn out than, than he is. And he's always going full throttle. And then just everybody else follows suit with that. Like it's, yeah, it's, I don't get it either, but uh, it's, it's enjoyable to watch. So my people suggested kind of what you said. I tweeted this during the Clippers game. People were like, is it the pace? Is it that they play so fast? Their team's tired. Like maybe, but it wasn't happening earlier in the season. And they've they played fast all season. If I had to come up with two theories, one would be what you just said. McConnell has been so good since the all-star break. Like, like one of their best two, three, four players since the all-star break. I mean, he's been unbelievable. He's hitting 60 plus percent of his shots every game. He runs that offense. His defense is pesky. Like he's just been awesome. That alone means that that unit can be good. They have a good ball handle on the floor all the time, even without the stars. My theory too is, and Dustin Dopierre has been all over this all season, but it's really come to fruition recently. Is like makes their bench good beyond that. It's good players. Like you saw this with the Clippers last night. A lot of teams use their benches like, two bench guys with these starters and then a different two guys with different starters. Like they're mixing and matching throughout the game. The Pacers bench all five or four or whatever together, like fits and makes sense, right? It's like a lineup that doesn't suck. And I think that's valuable too, that you can steal those minutes in that way. And then if the fifth guy is one of your stars, it even more makes sense, but that has helped too. Those are my theories. Can I toss you some numbers about past California uh, and the, the toss them away. All right, so this is not fourth quarter. This is all Pascal Siakam plus the bench lineup. So this is Pascal Siakam on the floor and none of Neesmith, Halbert, and Nemhard or Turner on the floor, okay? The Pacers have played 107 minutes. What do you think their plus minus is in those instances? So Pascal and no starters yes. in 107 minutes. Uh, plus 38. That would be really good, wouldn't it? They're better. Plus 44. <laughs> In 107 minutes with Pascal and no other starters. Their offensive rating, would you care to guess? Uh, 129. That would be pretty good, wouldn't it? 139.2 right now. <laughs> they have scored 316 points in 227 possessions in those instances. That's obviously insane and unsustainable. Their defense has not been good. 122.5 defensive rating. You'd hope that's better. But they, it doesn't matter. They just score every possession. Um, the the most common group so far has been McConnell, Shepard, Walker, Smith, Siakam. Uh, twenty seven minutes plus thirty eight. <laughs> it's just it's just crazy how good that's been, and that's across all quarters of a game, not just the fourth. So I, I look, that is forty six point seven percent on threes and sixty percent on twos. I think they can maybe sniff that two point percentage. The threes are gonna stop being that crazy at some point. So that's not going to hold like that high, but clearly there's something about this that has been working so far, even in this small sample. That's just been ridiculous, right? And that those lineups have just crushed teams. 
in a meaningful way. And maybe they can continue to have an insane offensive rating because it's Pascal Siakam against another team's bench. Would you like me to give you the fourth quarter numbers of the exact same scenario? Yes. Okay, 28 minutes we've had so far. Seen, we've seen so far, excuse me, uh, with Pascal Siakam and four bench players in the fourth quarter. In those 28 minutes, would you care to guess they're plus minus? So in 28 minutes, they're plus 44 and 107. So let's go uh, plus 28. That'd be pretty good. Oh, that is right. It's plus 26. <laughs> that was very close. That's still awesome. Winning time. They've been amazing. 93 points on 56 possessions. 166. 166 offensive already. That's insane. That's not even possible. 72% on twos, 60% on threes. That's 15 threes and 36 twos. So those are not going to hold. But the the putting of this 100-minute sample so far is like, oh, my God. <laughs> this has been like a transformative thing for the Pacers that – the bridge from their starters to their bench is just an insane line. And so even if their starters start the game poorly, they catch up right away. Even if they're behind a little bit in the second quarter, early in the fourth, they catch up. If they're ahead by big, they're going to win. Like that, that's just been the case with this. And I think that has been absolutely fascinating because they tried it with Halbert, and I'll pull up those numbers in a second. But Siakam plus the bench, maybe this won't hold forever, but so far has been unbelievably good. Yeah, I think one, one thing like we – uh, talked about whether Walker should play over Doug. Like Walker was in that plus 38 group that you said. Is that correct? Yes. So yep. there, if you want an argument for some numbers argument for Walker over Doug the rest of the there year, is. there it is. Uh, okay. Oops. I just, I forgot how to do this. And this is now going to sort poorly because I did the wrong guys. Uh, Halliburton plus the bench. So Halliburton, no starters this season. 163 minutes minus 11, right? And it's been fine, the fact that they can, like, minus 11 with four bench players. Every team will take that in 160 minutes. But they'll also take plus 40 whatever also over it. So I I don't know what to make of this. They, the, the bench is better than star players thing early in fourth quarters. Like, there's going to be one game where someone just melts them, right? But they have found something with their current rotational pattern. So much so that even without Aaron Neesmith on Monday, they went to it anyway, right? And it worked. It was huge. And they and they held off the Clippers for that early fourth quarter stretch. And I don't think we saw James Harden again the whole game, right? Like, they put the game away. They cleared their bench with a few minutes to go. So I'm not certain about if they can hold at its current elite level. But that has been, uh, you know, Rick talked about wanting to have one of the stars on for 48 minutes a couple weeks ago and asked him about it. That has been, as they've kind of evolved with their bench and their rotation through all these injuries, a big takeaway for them is that this is something that works. Yeah, and I don't, like, I can't remember a team for the Pacers that, like, had two guys like that. Like, sure, Tyrese is minus 11 with the bench, but, you know, he's he's been here the whole year, and, like, that's a, that's a, there's a lot of noise in there. And even just to play him even with one star and your bench is, like, not that bad. So, like, just to have those two stars to be able to do this, like, I can't think of a team, like, how far do you have to go back to where you really think the, the Pacers had two guys that they could individually say, okay, you can really run the offense right now. Like, the 2013-14 team was trying to do it with Lance. And <laughs> I love Lance, but, like, he's not a number one option. You shouldn't be in, a, in any lineup. Yeah, agreed. They have found something here. We'll see. I again, I they're not like any 100 minute sample with a 139 offensive rating is <laughs> it says a lot about sample sizes in the NBA, but they got something here. We will see how much it can hold and all they need it to hold for is like five or six more games. <laughs> they might secure a playoff spot. Last thing to get to before we dabble on the Bulls, the smallest amount, mostly because I just want to share something important about tonight's game. One more break here, guys. Let's first talk about Fire TV, Amazon's destination for sports. Live games, highlights, in-depth analysis, everything you could desire, plus more on Fire TV, which offers amazing viewing experiences with smart TVs, as well as the Fire TV stick that you can plug into existing TVs to provide access to millions of, of course, sports, plus movies, TV episodes, as well as free and live TV, whether it's opening weekend for baseball or the college basketball tournament you are going to want to have a Fire TV. Fire TV recently created Fire TV channels to deliver a constant supply of the latest videos from your favorite sports brands, all for free. 
That includes all of us here at Locked On, plus most of the big pro leagues and college conferences as well. Fire TV channels lets you dive into all of the game analysis, highlights, and more to keep up to date on all the latest in the world of sports, March Madness, NBA, MLB, and lots more. Not to mention great news, entertainment, gaming, travel, cooking videos as well. Check out Fire TV channels on Fire TV and Alexa devices. If you haven't checked them out, you should trust me. You can see me on there. To learn more, visit Amazon.com slash TV. Let's also talk about Nissan. Are you the type of driver that loves to push things a little further or ever wondered what adventure could be around the next corner? Well, our friends at Nissan have a lineup of SUVs with the capabilities to take your adventure to the next level, like the 2024 Nissan Rogue, the perfect vehicle for city drives and great escapes. Their class-exclusive Google built-ins is your always updating assistant to call on for almost anything. Gone are the days of connecting your phone. Google Assisted, Google Maps, and Google Play Store are built right in to the 12.3-inch HD touchscreen infotainment system. The 2024 Rogue is perfect for mid, the perfect mid-size crossover for your next adventure. Plus, the 2024 Nissan Armada will change what you expect from a full-size SUV. Picture a rugged 4x4 that can seat up to 8 in first-class luxury and style. Tow bigger and explore further in the 2024 Armada. And don't forget the Pathfinder as well. Take the Nissan Rogue. Nissan Pathfinder or Nissan Armada and go find your next big adventure. Shop now at NissanUSA.com. Uh, Derek, did you know this? On the season, the Pacers no longer have a bottom five defense. Whoa. That, that is <laughs> they're, news. They're up to 25th in defensive rating. Wow. Small victories for the Pacers. <laughs> Uh, the one spot out of the bottom five. The bottom five is the Jazz, Wizards, Hornets, Hawks, and Pistons. So not great being above that group. And they're a .8 away from 24th. So they're still like firmly in a bad tier. The reason they're out of the bottom five in defensive rating is because in March, they have been a good defensive team. Not great, but good. Currently in the month of March, the Pacers defensive rating is 17th at 114.0. They are 0.3 away from 14th and above average, right? The margins are thin. Without the Lakers game, they were top 10 in defense in the month of March, and that game was terrible, and they deserve to be punished for it. But they're defending much better recently, and entering that Lakers game in their last six games, they were sixth in the league in defense, and their offensive rating is sixth in the month of March. So it hasn't required a ton of sacrifice. A little bit, a little bit, but not a ton. What is this a thing? Like, are they actually an okay defensive team now? Is this going to be like late December where it's good for like two weeks and then it kind of stumbles again? What do you make of this? Is there something to this? I think that they're like, they can legit at least like play decent defense. So I'm not going to say that like, kind of I tweeted out a few games ago, like over their last 10 games, they were sixth in the NBA in defensive rating. Yeah, they, they were. I, mean, I don't think that's like a real thing but i think that they can be average now and i think a lot of it is just like putting pascal at the four let's knee smith guard threes and nimhard guard ones and ones or twos whichever one makes more sense in the matchup and like just just the lineups make more sense like that was one of the like pluses of getting a real power forward in pascal and then like just like they're definitely figuring it out i think the the laxing of the letting the defense play more physical or not calling the fouls typically where the, the parallel lines and the offensive player runs into the other guy or whatever they said the focus was seems to be working for the Pacers to their advantage so far. Um, other than the Lakers game, like they haven't had huge foul totals. It seems like, I don't know what the numbers look like for fouls lately. If that's how that correlates. Have a lot of fouls in Lakers game? I know. I got what? We didn't hear. I didn't say. I didn't talk about that at all. No, nothing. Um, but yeah, I think it's. I like they're not going to be amazing on that end, but I like. It seems like they can be adequate, which is what they need if they can like have their offense and Tyrese be who he is, and Pascal be anything close to what he's been the last couple weeks. Like that's what they need to have success. Yep. So last two weeks, this includes the Lakers game. I did the 14th through the 28th, which how is it almost marches over? Um, last two weeks, they are 12th. Or excuse me. Last two weeks, they're 14th. Last three weeks, so March 7th to the 28th, they're 12th. And then last almost four weeks. I only do – this is intentional data manipulation. I'm telling on myself. Every game in March except that Pelicans game, 
where the craziest first quarter ever happened. They're above average. They're 14th, right? So that game happened. They deserve to be dinged for it. But you can almost go four full weeks of the Pacers being an above average defense with two anomalies, the Pelicans and the Lakers. And though again, those are bad games. There's a reason they're below average. I'm not saying they've been above average in this month. But like you, they have a legitimate sample now. A not embarrassing amount of time where it's like, oh, it's kind of a thing. And like it was actually disappointing in that Lakers game. Like Halliburton was not as physical defensively. And that's been something he's gotten better at, at least to me, this month, right? Like they've seen some incremental uh, improvements in their communication. They're not getting destroyed in the paint as much. That was, you know, that that game against the Nets where they just dominated the paint. That was kind of a transition point in my head of like, oh, they've kind of reemphasized how they're defending. So I don't, I don't know. Like they have Lakers again who've been awesome on offense since the all-star break coming up OKC late next week. Like they have some good offenses that will test them still this season, but this might be a thing. They might be like a, a mediocre defense instead of a bad defense. And if their offense can hold, they keep wobbling on results by losing close games. But this seems like a, the, the, the profile of a team that should be better than, you know, 500 in their last whatever games, but here we are. Yeah. The clutch games, those clutch losses have definitely like, makes it feel like they're not they haven't been playing as well as they have overall last four um, losses all by five or less yeah so like they're not getting blown out of the water anytime lately even in the like the anomaly game with the lakers like they still even with the all the stuff going on and giving up like 56 percent shooting and all that stuff they like they still made it a game at the end Agreed. We'll see if this could hold. I am fascinated by that. I think that might be that might be the way they make the playoffs. If they can hold their defense. I mean, they, it, I don't want to say this. This has never been a There's good thing for the Pacers. Schedule's looking easier coming up soon. Uh, another Derek? reason. Another uh, another reason you could you could argue play Jarris over Doug. I'm just gonna bring that back <laughs> every time. Yes. Yes. Uh, if you want your defense to continue to be good, uh Jarris is definitely a better defender than Doug McDermott. Uh, yeah, McDermott, uh, to put it politically, not known for his defense. All right, Pacers, Bulls tonight. This sounds crazy. Let me get to the point. If the Pacers win, they'll clinch a tiebreaker over the Bulls. Likely doesn't matter. They're way ahead of the Bulls in the standings. The Bulls have lost three in a row. As it stands, the Pacers are six and a half games ahead of the Bulls with like 10 to go. They're going to finish ahead of the Bulls. They're really going to finish ahead of the Bulls if they beat them in this game. Uh, and clinch the tiebreaker. They would also clinch the tiebreaker over the Cavs if they beat the Bulls because that would be their 12th division win. And so even if they lose to the Cavs at the end of the season, they would be a half game better in division because they played an extra game than Cleveland, even if the series is 2-2. So they would clinch two tiebreakers by winning one game, even though both of them are super unlikely to actually matter. <laughs> the Cavs, as it stands, are only three and a half ahead of the Pacers. It's not like insane to say that it could matter, but it probably won't. Either way, very important game <laughs> from that perspective for the Pacers, who have lost to the Bulls twice this season. So they've not been an easy opponent. But should they pull that off, they would have the tiebreaker over the two, three, four, eight, nine, and 10 seeds. So, and the TBD with the Heat, the only team they've lost it with is the Orlando Magic, that's actually relevant to the playoff standings for the Pacers. So, in that way, an important game and also an important game because Derek, I don't want to jinx anything, but there's a minute and a half to go in Warriors heat and the Warriors are up by 16. So the Pacers could be up a game and a half over the seven and eight seeds by the time people are listening to this, unless the most crazy comeback in NBA history happens. So big game uh, end of a road trip can be hard division game. Bulls of art again, already beaten them twice. The Rosen just kicked their behinds, but it's an important game. They got to get it. Yes. Uh, like, I don't know what the, it's like, how do you trick the Pacers into uh, like thinking, <laughs> the, like, do you have to like tell them DeMar DeRozan's Michael Jordan? Like, does that like, <laughs> Blind like them all that way? On, on their way in, tell them, Hey, <laughs> they rebuilt the United center in your hometown. <laughs> so this is actually um, Pacers bulls in Ames, Iowa, or, Detroit, Michigan area or oh, Dallas area. <laughs> <laughs> That's how they uh, they did win in Chicago, funnily enough, and lost two at home to the Bulls. But big game. I mean, if they look, they basically already secured. They're going to be at worst eight. They're like two games away from actually doing that. That it's more than that. It's close though. If they win this game, it's almost impossible for them to not be top eight. 
and they'd clinch a lot of tiebreakers and the Cavs not playing great. Like it's a big, it's a big game. It is a big game in a lot of ways. They could still have the tiebreaker over the Cavs by just beating them later in the season, but why not secure it now when you can? So if they slow down DeMar, I think they win. <laughs> that was literally the only reason they lost last time beyond like a fluke, less than 10% circumstance happening in the, the game. We'll see. I just find this game to be fascinating and important. If they can go four and one on this road trip, I would never have expected that. They'd be looking pretty good, especially with this heat loss coming. Yeah, very impressive road trip and uh, challenging. Um, anytime you go out west, that's a that's a very challenging road trip. So important stretch here, and yeah, we'll see if they can take care of business against these lesser teams that have given them problems all year. And maybe that's part of the issue. They just like have that in their head, like they know this team isn't that good, but they should probably like be respecting the opponent more than calling them a lesser opponent. Like maybe that's part of it. I don't know. I'm just, I I'm so befuddled by the, by it all year that I don't get it. Yeah. I, I act like, I'm not trying to say it's a good thing that they've lost six games to just absolutely awful teams. I think people are being unfair when they say, Oh, they, they I've done this. So I've, I'm also being unfair when we say, Oh, they'd be in fourth or third if they had just cleaned up in those games. Yeah, they'd also not be as good of a seed if they didn't go like they have probably one of the best records against the top four in each conference in the league. So uh they're that's why, it's, that's why it's frustrating, like for yeah. a fan when they look at that, like like why can you beat all of these like they're one of like six teams with an above five hundred record, maybe even like only one of four teams in the east with an above five hundred record against like playoff teams like so, there's not that many of them that are like have good records against the good teams but they like the but then you look at the like bottom feeders and it's like they're worse by like five games than any other playoff team they currently have 12 wins against the top four in each conference <laughs> That's, i know they have one more game in that against okc at home too so they could even make that bigger uh and the clippers if they pass the pelicans it'd still be 12 right so like that, that, that's so high, clearly. So on one hand, you could be like, well, well, they just cleaned up in these games. Yeah. Also, like if they didn't outkick their coverage, for lack of a better term, in these top end games, uh, maybe you wouldn't be feeling the same way. Uh, yeah. As it stands, though, you're right. They are 24 and 20 against 500 or better teams. Do you know how many teams in the entire NBA? Oh, there's more than I thought. Never mind. Uh, the answer is five teams in the league have more than 24 wins against above 500 teams. Minnesota, OKC, Denver, Milwaukee, barely, and Boston. That's it. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, their their top end certainly looks good. The and sixth, then they lose the Bulls a lot. Sixth best team in the league against winning teams. Yep. Like, that's that's very impressive. And, you like, that's not something you can count on happening probably next they year. They also have uh, 12 losses against below 500 teams, which right. is – the most, oh no, there that's the second most of any team <sighs> play in or better in either conference. Do you know who has more losses against crappy teams? Play in or better either conference who has more than 12 losses against sub 500 teams. Um, uh, is it like the Bulls? It is the Hawks. You were on the right track, just pick the worst team <laughs> that, that is available to pick from this group. <laughs> so, again, I hate to just keep shrugging and saying we'll see, but. The Pacers have not given themselves the benefit of the doubt of pointing at their schedule or saying that they're home heavy the rest of the way or anything like that. They got to win. And that starts tonight with Chicago. Derek, thank you for the time. Tell people where they can find the Miles High Club, where you can see every player that Miles Turner, who holds a franchise record for blocks, have been heard, blocked in his career. All the rest of your work covering the Pacers can still be credentialed for most of their home games the rest of the way and all the rest of your Pacers stuff. Yes, you can see all 424 players uh, in a nice little list of all the people that Miles Turner has blocked in his career. Uh, started doing that in his rookie season, just as like a joke with the Miles High Club thing. And then, you know, it was just a fun thing to do. Uh, Andre Drummond, the guy who has been blocked the most, also the guy who has played Miles Turner the most, but that's another story. Um, yeah, ipacers.com, uh, at ipacers blog on Twitter. Follow me, I'm almost uh, 7,000, I think. Ooh. You know who surprised me the most on the block list for for Miles? Who? In ninth place, right? Okay, for, for those who don't know where, here's the top 10. I'm not going to say them in order. I just, just so you can see the surprise player. LeBron, played him a lot, drives a lot. Jimmy Butler, Bam, Zach Levine, James Harden, DeMar DeRozan, Giannis Drummond. Guys, he's played a lot and guys around the basket a lot. 
and sneak it into the top 10 for some freaking reason is Bismack Biombo. How has he blocked Bismack Biombo so much? I don't get it. I don't know if he, because part of like the playoff series against the Raptors, like that's why DeRozan's up there. Cause he blocked him like 10 times just in those seven games. <laughs> so like, like his block totals for the franchise record doesn't include playoffs. Like Jermaine still has that if you include playoffs. But like the the numbers are, it's crazy how high DeRozan is just because of that series. And I wonder if Biombo, I think he was on those Raptors teams, if I remember correctly. I think he's gotten a few in that series as well. So that might be part of it, but it's still like him and Cody Zeller are also like Cody Zeller's way up there. Like Cody Zeller has 10, 10 of them. Yeah, all the ra- Kelly Oubre is surprising a little bit, but he's just the rest. I'm like, what? How? Uh, it's a very, again fascinating. You should all go check it out. You can see his first block all the way to the record. Shout out to Jermichael Green, a guy I thought the Pacers should sign several times for being first on the list. Tomorrow we'll be talking Pacers Bulls. I'll be there. We'll talk about the game, what happened, the key storylines. Did the Pacers win? What does that mean for their standings? And of course, we'll do standings watch. We'll talk all the tiebreakers tomorrow in more detail. And I'll even get into a little bit of three-team tiebreaker stuff. If the Magic could go ahead and clinch their division, that would make it a lot easier for me to do that exercise. Uh, but a little bit of ways to go. On that front, thank you all a ton for listening today. Have a wonderful day. We'll see you soon.